Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Byte Ventures, where we deep dive into the marvels of technology. In today's case study, uh, we'll discuss about how Reddit manages its view count per post. Uh, that means whenever you see a post, how does it maintain the total number of views or impressions that it has rendered? It's very interesting. Okay, let's dive deep in. Okay, so a couple of things before we move on to the problem. So this were the specification that was specified by Reddit. So back in 2017, when the voting and comments were something that led for a higher visibility of a post or led a high score of a post, Reddit wanted to come up with something because it had figured out that there are a lot of audience which don't interact or don't comment, don't upvote, rather just see and go from there. So the product managers thought like, okay, why not we implement something where we can record the impressions or record the view counts so that people who might be interested in just reading would see that, okay, this might be a very popular post and would take it from there as well. That was the whole history of Reddit taking from there. So the first thing that Reddit wanted was to lay out the problem statement pretty clearly. And they had this four important metrics to be taken care of. The first were, the counting that the post receive should be real time without any aggregates like daily aggregates or hourly aggregates should not be part of the problem statement. That was the first condition. The second was having user count in a particular small window, right? That means uh, given, for example, a two hour time frame, a user should not be counted twice in that two hour time frame if he visits it twice. So probably if he visits after three hours, then he should be counted twice. The third thing was most important was the percentages of error. They don't want uh, to be something having very high error rates, but which has very less error rates. And even if it doesn't guarantee very accurate results, but low error rates would still work. And the fourth was running at production scale without much latency. That was the concern, like because they have huge system which can scale up to like millions and billions of views in a very particular a very short and particular time frame, they would want them that this feature should be included in that. That is something we would be focusing on. Okay, so before moving forward to that, let's just think that, okay, what might be the solutions for it, right? This is something that the product people, the designers and art thought about it first. Okay, we discussed the problem statement. What should the solution space looking like? Um, so if you think about this, what could be the data structure that we recently covered and that allows or has all of these features that we just discussed in the past. So if you're thinking about hyperlog log, then that's right, it's correct. So hyperlog log is taking care of all of the functionalities that we have. So first, it provides a real-time upgrades without having much um, aggregations or stuff like that. The second is it provides a unique user count within a short window. And the third thing is it has very, very less error percentages. So because uh, last time we saw that Reddit implementation, which was producing only 0.81% error rate while identifying um, unique numbers in 1 billion records, right? That was like very less percentages of error. And the fourth thing was like running at a production scale. Uh, what does that mean? That means that it should have high capabilities of handling scale without much latency going on. That was something very, very interesting. And that uh, was easily handled by HLL. So it was running perfectly at the production scale. So considering all of this, uh, then it was a very right choice to go for hyperlog log or HLL for short. I would rate HLL first, right? So this was, uh, the clarity that the team received that, okay, this is something that we want to continue using further and we want to take it for forward from this. Okay, after selecting this, what is the next problem statement that comes in, right? So the next problem statement that comes in is selecting the implementation because as we have thought that HLL is just a probabilistic data structure, right? So there must be many such implementation out there in the world that does this job perfectly fine as per the requirement, right? folks uh, who are having no clue about hyperlog log. Uh, so this is something we discussed last week, uh, the complete implementation of how things are internally. Uh, what are the ways that it achieves such high performance with such less usage of memory and all stuff. 
So I highly recommend you guys to check out uh, the video. I'll link it in the description and it will give you a lot more context and a lot more confidence of how things are built from there. And you'll be able to make a lot of more sense from this video. Then they have this problem statement here. So what is the primary thing they are looking for? As most of their code base was in Java and Scala, so they were looking specifically for those implementations that were based out of Java or Scala. So they have shortlisted or these were some of the libraries that caught their eye. The first is Twitter algebra implementation. This was something they were very interested in uh, because of its popularity, of course. So many of you might be thinking that, okay, the company is named as X, why are you still calling Twitter? Uh, so I'm still calling Twitter because it's still reflected under Twitter's GitHub. So I would still go with that name. The second uh, important thing that they got into was the hyperlog log plus in streamlib. Uh, that was an implementation in Java and that was also something they got interested in. The third and the final thing that they came across was the Redis HLL implementation. So it was very interesting as well to like have multiple implementation compare and contrast to select one of them. And you know what? What did they select out of these three rather? They selected Redis's HLL implementation in that case. Uh, you might be curious like, okay, why Redis only? Why not Twitter algebra? Like, because Twitter is also doing things at a lot higher scale or probably at a similar scale, uh, then why not this? Pretty interesting, let's find out. So what can, uh, or what are the advantages that were provided by Redis HLL implementation that made them decide that, okay, this is the first thing. Okay, so the first thing was the clear and succinct documentation. The documentation was pretty clear and easy to follow, which allowed them to onboard their features pretty easily on that. Next, the configuration. As it was a very configurable, very easy to manage them, so they were like, okay, let's go forward with this implementation. And the third and the most important thing was the integration, right? So because when they were using the third party's API, it should be very easy without any hassle to integrate the APIs into their workflow, into their big scalable architectures, right? That would should not consume a lot of technical effort and should not induce a lot of tech debt. And that integration was flawless and it was pretty, pretty smooth. And that led to a huge impact on the decision making. The last and the most important is the performance concern. As Redis has its own server, the compute and the input output intensity or, or the requirement I would say were moved to a different server altogether, right? So in that case, they didn't have to care about like, okay, should we have this in our own server or stuff, stuff like that? And that's how they migrated this to a different place and it helped them save a lot of their problems. So now that they have decided Redis um, hyperlog log because of these features, Let's just see that, okay, what exactly was the architecture after they used uh, the hyperlog log in their own algorithm? Okay, this was more or less the algorithm that was getting used at Reddit for the whole counting purposes, right? Okay, so for all of their major data pipelines, uh, Reddit was using Kafka. Sorry, so what exactly is Kafka? So Kafka is an open source streaming service uh, provided by Apache that is very useful for event-driven architecture, right? So that means when someone is pushing the events into one place and someone is consuming from there, then Kafka seems to be a pretty apt choice for that. So when uh, there is a read or there is a user that is reading a new post, there was an event that was getting fired from the server to something called as event collector server. This was something that was getting fired uh, for that, right? That means each of this view or whatever different kinds of events they have registered, they would get fired as soon as those kind of events occurred in real time. So these events reached the event collector from multiple places and this event collector server was responsible for batching them and sending them to the Kafka stream that they have here, right? So Kafka is kind of a service that is used. So we would refer as when someone inputs it to Kafka, someone can consume it. So it's kind of a place to hold this record. So it's like a dumping ground for this events as well. Okay, so now that Kafka is here, uh, we know that to consume events, we need to have a consumer for us, right? And that is what this Nuzzer is. So Nuzzer is the first Kafka consumer that they have, which was reading events from Kafka. 
and because um, they, someone has to decide okay which is a valid count what is the time frame for that uh, what is the error percentages uh, what is the unique IP or if this is a blacklisted one or not there were like bunch of rules for that right and for that reason someone has to lay down a list of rules based on which this consumer can say that okay this is a valid count event or not so based on that the another consumer took a decision of whether to register it as a valid count event or invalid count event and then push it back into the Kafka with it modifying the event, adding a new field, a new Boolean field rather, whether it is valid or invalid field. So many of you might be thinking like, what exactly the, the Redis is doing here, right? So what exactly is the Redis? Okay, so the Redis part is very, very interesting because uh, once the Nazar consumer decides that, okay, this is valid or invalid for the safe, uh, for the reason of, um, what do you say? analysis at later end or probably summarization or something it used this as a store which kind of used to store the snapshot and stuff like that so whenever it reduced the reason that okay this was the reason why it was being rejected as not a valid view event it would have registered that it kind of stored the snapshot of all of the events that were getting flown to the another consumer so the another consumer changed the events, pushed it back to Kafka uh, with the modified Boolean field. So now coming to the second and most important part, that was how actually the count was getting registered, how it was getting fulfilled by something called as another consumer. So Abacus here was the second and most important consumer, which was responsible for the counting. So what Abacus did was it was feeding in, like feeding from the events that were output by Nazar that had the boolean field or that is deciding that whether this is a valid view event or not and based on that it updated redis and cassandra okay like why redis and cassandra again like probably one of them would do right because redis is a remote dictionary server right and it is used to store the key value pair of sorts and cassandra is a nosql database management system which allows the very high efficient reads and writes, highly scalable, very fault tolerant, easily horizontally scalable and stuff, but why both? Very interesting question. So let's get to this in the next slide. So what they want to do. So here, when we have decided that the second part is the most important part because that is what is responsible for the view count, let's dive deep into it. So here was the Kafka a uh, Kafka cluster, I would say, where the Nazar consumer modified and put events into it. And this was the place from which the Abacus consumer consumed the events from it, right? So what exactly was it doing? So to manage a lot of things, as Redis was a in-memory cache kind of thing, uh, there was a possibility of things getting evicted out from Redis as well, because as it is limited to in-memory, it was limited to the size of the RAM that we have. So suppose we have like, 16 gigs of RAM in a machine, it was limited to that, right? What if there are more number of posts and we need to go beyond 16 gigs of RAM? Then you need a secondary storage for that, right? And that is what we did achieve with Cassandra. So what they checked. So when they got an event, if that was a valid event, if that was an invalid event, they just rejected it right from here. If that was a valid event, so I would say a valid event here, they would say that, okay, if the HLL for that post, because the event would be for a particular post, right? Uh, a post has a count. So a count has to be tied up back to a post. So whether this is a valid event, they check that whether it's available in Redis. What exactly is available? The hyperlog log structure is available in Redis or not because it is data structure, right? So if it is available, then they just went ahead and updated the HLL count in Redis, right? That was pretty simple. But what if it was no? So if the HLL in Redis was not available, it can be either of two cases because as we have discussed, Cassandra was used as a storage mechanism for storing all the HLL metadata and stuff like that, which we can fetch uh, later when it was evicted from Redis cache, right? So it can either be not present in Cassandra, that means this is the first time someone is reading a new post or it is existing in Cassandra and we need to fetch it. So if it is existing in Cassandra, that means it is an older post, it was just evicted from the Redis memory. 
So what we did is like we retrieved uh, the HLL from the Cassandra and we set it in the HLL in Redis. So HLL in Redis is a very special data structure, but it was implemented as a string type. That's why with the operations of set and get, we could easily serialize and deserialize the HLLs and store it in different servers as well. So that was a lot helpful in achieving this result. So once we received uh, from Cassandra, we updated an HLL. Okay, now if we didn't have that, that means this is the first time someone is reading a post and that's when we need to create the HLL in Redis as well, right? So this is the path that would follow. Okay, now let me have said something very critical that after a certain time frame, the cache gets evicted and that's when we need to take a call that, okay, we need to store this in somewhere. And as for the Reddit team, they decided that this should go in Cassandra, okay? So, but if we just push out events to Cassandra, that would create a huge load on the Cassandra clusters as well, right? So what they did is very, very interesting. They did a very smart approach of batching the right request together. So they did take a 10 seconds time frame on which um, they just took that, okay, whatever request that we have, we'll just dump it together as a batch into Cassandra. And that's what they achieved. So this created a very efficient cycle for managing their whole structures. They don't want to now create any push kind of event. Now that they're time-based, each 10 seconds, there'll be a batch right to Cassandra, and that would help them store this for a longer time. As Cassandra was very effective in reading and writing queries, it would make the latency is pretty, pretty small, and it would increase the throughput without affecting a lot of the operations here, right? And yeah, by this way, they could just achieve whatever they wanted that, okay, this is very interesting, and they would just go back to that, right? So if we come back to this diagram, so now that we have proper, pretty clear understanding of how things work. So here we have that, the another consumer made the first filter, considered this as the store for uh, the historic operation that, okay, this did this. Then we have it inputted into Kafka and this whole part was respons responsible for the counting mechanics, right? So yeah, that's all guys. And that's all for today. And I hope you like this video. Um, I would attach all of the reference documents, the research articles that I have done in the description. Please feel free to read them and ask me any questions in the comment section. I hope you liked the video and let me know if you have any feedbacks for that stuff. Otherwise, that's all for today, guys. Uh, have a nice day and see you in the next one.